Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Amusement parks are meant to be fun. You eat a little funnel cake, you get on a roller coaster, and then you eject that funnel cake into the nearest garbage can. You know, fun. But in between bites of corn dogs and slurps of lemonade are rides that are meant to thrill and excite you. But several parks haven't always been so amusing. In fact, at one time, they were pretty problematic. Not because of the attractions or the food, but because of how they came to be. Before Six Flags, Dorney Park, and Dollywood, there was Coney Island. Do a quick search online, and you'll likely find early footage from any of Coney Island's famous parks. You'll see women in long dresses and men in suits riding on a scenic railway or holding on for dear life as the famous Cyclone roller coaster shakes its wooden frame. But long before Coney Island was known as a place for families to spend the day riding rides and playing games, it was known by one unfortunate name, Sodom by the Sea. Let's back up for a moment. Coney Island is located in southwestern Brooklyn and became a prime vacation spot starting in the 1830s. It was far enough away from Manhattan and the other boroughs that many New Yorkers would flock to its beaches for a quick getaway. The next several decades were full of growth and development, with the installation of a ferry, as well as several hotels and restaurants. Then, in 1897, New York businessman George Tillieu built Steeplechase Park, complete with a Ferris wheel, a Wild West sideshow, and various slide-based rides. It was enticing to locals who were looking for a cheap way to pass the afternoon. But Tillieu's greed and desire for growth wound up costing him dearly. You see, he had secured the rights to another ride built by two entrepreneurs for his park, but they didn't just want to license their creation. They saw what Tillyu had built and decided to go into business as direct competitors to Steeplechase. And so Fred Thompson and Skip Dundee started working on the now-famous Luna Park. But neither amusement park was attracting posh elite clients. Coney Island became a haven for the lower and middle classes who couldn't afford the whole summer in Spain or winter in Paris. And because of its close proximity to the rest of New York, its sandy beaches and ample boardwalk became crammed with vacationers during the busiest seasons. Music from buskers and bands filled the air as fortune tellers and other con artists lured unsuspecting visitors into their shops, promising them a glimpse of their future for a nominal fee, of course. In fact, it bore more of a resemblance to Pleasure Island in Pinocchio than Las Vegas. As one writer described it in a 1905 issue of the Cosmopolitan magazine, Coney Island exists, he wrote, and will go on existing, because into all men, gentle and simple, poor and rich, including women, by some mysterious corybantic instinct in their blood, has been born a tragic need of coarse excitement, a craving to be taken in by some illusion, however palpable. And that coarse excitement took form in a number of questionable ways. For example, Thompson and Dundee brought in an elephant named Topsy to keep visitors entertained while Luna Park was being built. But after a short time, Topsy's maintenance and behavior, because after all, she was a wild animal, had them rethinking their purchase. Rather than sell her off to a zoo or a circus, though, they decided to give the people one last show. They electrocuted her to death, and the whole thing was recorded on film. The pair also staged displays of indigenous peoples from the Philippines, portraying them as, and I quote, uncivilized savages, to enthrall their white patrons, of course. As the years passed by, others, like William Reynolds, erected their own competing parks with bright, flashy attractions, But in the end, only two parks stood the test of time, Luna Park and Dino's Wonder Wheel Amusement Park, which opened in 1920. Its famous Wonder Wheel Ferris Wheel has become as iconic as the Coney Island Cyclone Coaster. During the 1970s, and for the next three decades after that, Coney Island went through a number of ups and downs, with several parks and rides falling into disrepair. But today, the former Sodom by the Sea is refreshed and revitalized, and it welcomes more than 5 million visitors per year from all over the country. It's fun for the whole family, and no elephants have been harmed on the property in at least a century.
In 1986, Roy Duncan decided it was finally time to get to the bottom of a local rumor. Roy lived on one of the Isles of Scilly, a tiny archipelago just off the coast of Cornwall in the United Kingdom. For generations, Siloians had claimed their tiny islands had been at war with the Netherlands. If there was a war, Roy thought, it certainly was an odd one. He couldn't remember ever seeing a Dutch army or warship, and neither could his father or grandfather. There was no battle, no treaties, not even a skirmish as far as he could tell. So Roy wrote to the Dutch embassy in London to get to the bottom of the mystery. The embassy's answer was surprising. According to their records, the Netherlands had in fact declared war on the Isles of Scilly in 1651. And as far as they could tell, no peace treaty was ever signed. So technically the Dutch and the Silanians had been fighting for 335 years. So how exactly did a tiny little archipelago full of fishermen become embroiled in the longest war in history? Well, you can blame Oliver Cromwell for that. Back in 1651, England was in the grip of a bloody civil war. Parliamentarians, led by Oliver Cromwell, wanted to limit the powers of the English monarchy and give most of England's legislative power to a constitutional parliament, thus the name Parliamentarians. And their opponents, the Royalists, wanted the English king to have absolute power. Cromwell's parliamentarians had swept over the country, pushing the royalists back to the furthest point south in England, the tiny Isles of Scilly. The entire royalist navy was docked at the Isles, waiting for Cromwell to launch his final attack. At the same time, the Dutch were fighting their own war to gain independence from Spain. Early in the conflict, England helped the Dutch allies. So, when the Netherlands were finally free of Spanish rule, they wanted to return the favor. Since England was so divided, the Dutch were forced to pick a side. And seeing the writing on the wall for the Royalists, the Dutch backed Cromwell and his parliamentarians. Now, the Royalists who were docked at the Isles of Scilly considered this a stab in the back. In retaliation, they raided Dutch merchants in the English Channel, seizing their ships and cargo for the Royalist cause. Well, on March 30th of 1651, a Dutch lieutenant admiral named Martin Tromp demanded the Royalists pay the Dutch for what they had stolen. When the Royalists refused, Tromp declared war on the only Royalist-held land in England, the Isles of Scilly. In retrospect, it's actually not certain that Tromp had the authority to declare war for an entire country. At the most, Dutch leadership probably expected him to establish a blockade. It's also pretty unclear if, even if Tromp could declare war, could he declare it on just one small part of another nation? Regardless, the declaration stood. And when the Royalists finally surrendered to Cromwell three months later in June of 1651, the Dutch sailed home without ever officially ending the war. For years, it became something of a local legend, until Roy Duncan received the fateful letter from the Dutch embassy in 1986. Wishing to bury the hatchet, Roy invited the Dutch ambassador to the Isles of Scilly to end the conflict. On April 17th of 1986, the Dutch ambassador arrived at the Isles of Scilly. He brought with him a signed peace treaty, declaring that after 335 years, the war between the Netherlands and the Isles of Scilly was officially over. All without firing a single shot. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.